confound this cursed rain. Ah, there you are. Thank you for joining me here in this small, remote location. I didn't know if you enjoyed the idea of going out much. In the wilderness, I mean. A domain where we shouldn't stay for too long, lest other powerful beings take note. But there are kindred who ignore this warning. And it is one of them I wish to meet with tonight. You would not be surprised to hear that they are first and foremost gangrels, and there are quite a lot of them that do this. The majority of which just act like the ones I've discussed before, and they are often known as country gangrels. But for the most part, those are just independent gangrels that live their lives in the woods and the like. No, the group I wish to speak of today are different. See, today, I wish to speak of several bloodlines from a time long gone that often acted more like beasts than man. People who, for most regards, couldn't even fit into society anymore, even though this was purely due to how long they had been out in the wilderness. A group I like to dub the Wild Gangrel. For a start, like most groups that do this sort of thing, they are quite attached to a culture and its home region, often being very traditional as a result. And because of how old some of these cultures are, they will have practices that will be seen as very weird for a modern context. Mind you that all of these groups have in some way lost the majority of their number, and in fact, some of them are just gone entirely, extinct as it were, with the peak of the wild gangrels being what we would now call the Dark Ages, when raiding barbarians were still a problem. When these people were being conquered and converted, it was about on part of the same thing happening in kindred society as well. Most of them resent the Camarilla in some form for this reason. Like most Gangrel, they just wanted to be left alone. However, unlike most Gangrels, they actively hunted, mauled, and killed anyone that stumbled into what arbitrary part of the woods that they had deemed was their own. And for that reason, they truly were a threat. Which leads others to want to destroy them. It's a self-perpetuating circle of violence, and the sort of thing I really love when I don't have to get involved with it. Unfortunately, when you are as old as I, you sometimes have to get involved with these things. As I did many times in the past. Anyway, let's get to the topic at hand. The four bloodlines I wish to discuss today. All of them more outdoorsy than any self-righteous kindred should be. I'll start with an all-female group of Viking warriors that have actually been destroyed once before, the Ari Mains. They do have a modern rebirth, but it's a little different. See, the Ari Mains were actual Vikings, a sub-branch of the normal Gangrels, who were also Vikings at this time. What made this group stand out, though, were their more spiritual practices. See, their founder believed herself to be a descendant of the goddess Freya, and that the goddess herself chose her to start this bloodline. For whatever purpose, though, that's been completely forgotten. They served as a sort of vanguard or scouting force for the Gangrels of Scandinavia, and performed all sorts of violent and bloodthirsty sacrifices in the names of their gods, aided by their unique powers known as Spiritus, although many think it was just a special manifestation of Auspex. Regardless of what you believe, this gave them powers over spirits of animals specifically, letting them communicate and summon them, small things like that. It actually wasn't that impressive, to be honest with you. These Valkyries were not around for long, however, and they were eventually cut down one after the other, all dying in various horrid ways. Warrior deaths, though, so I suppose they probably wanted that in some weird regard. But if you recall, there is a modern rebirth of this group. Quite a recent one from my perspective, supposedly a gangrel woman started having visions of the old group of our remains and sought to bring them back. She managed to rally others to her cause, and they rediscovered their powers of old and started living out in the wilds of Southern America. Due to the sudden upheaval this caused, it resulted in a conflict between them and the Camarilla, and due to them being radically smaller in numbers, they sought out the aid from the Sabbat order to survive. They still remained aligned with the Sabbat after such wars, but made it clear that they had no real allegiance to them. This was more of a convenience thing for the remaining Aramains. 
Many of them took to calling themselves the Cats, and it is said this group takes on more feline-like qualities than most Gangrel. But sometime in the late 90s, however, this group started disappearing again. Or rather, their leader and about half of their number did, meaning their already tiny numbers have been hit even worse. Those Sabat who were their allies said they went into their havens and saw no sign of them, believing them to have all met their final deaths. Some, however, think their connection to spiritual powers allowed them to somehow enter the spirit world and think that they are simply hiding there. What that is is a long story for another night, one I probably will never get into in all earnest, but that's about all I have to say on the remains for now. A group many find intriguing, and I believe are little more than a footnote in earnest, as they were tiny, didn't accomplish a single one of their goals, and vanished. The fact that they managed to do that twice is what makes them intriguing. But on to the next group, one tied to another old culture, the Anda, who tied themselves closely to the Mongolians. Well, they actually predate the people by a bit, and in many ways had a hand in all of the nomadic steppe peoples of that region, but they took a great pride when they tied themselves to the Mongolians, and they did rule them during their peak, of both the Mongolians and the Ander. The main thing to note about them is their blatant breaching of the Masquerade, something they've only recently seemed to have stopped doing, and their inherent meritocratic beliefs. See, the ancient bloodline ruled the nomadic steppe peoples openly back then, as most of us did, but they were less tyrants in their castles, and more, well, we are the strongest, so it would be better if we lead. They did view themselves as greater than the kind, however. Or, perhaps I should say, above the mortals, for they believed themselves to be more of a spirit than a vampire, as we've been come to know. When one lone soldier or herdsman took their attention, they called for a meeting of all of their members, who decided whether they should be embraced or not, and by who. They all got their say in the matter, but this was not a democratic vote. Some members, typically the most powerful or the eldest, had a lot more sway. They were merely listening to their counsel. A strategy of leadership I find to be quite wise, and actually commend them on this. Once embraced, they would be fanatically loyal, as most of them were. Loyalty was their foremost virtue, with many of them often dying in the name to just preserve the reputation of their bloodline. The leaders of these vampiric groups were, of course, referred to as the Khans, and like the mortal nomads, they practiced every aspect of their life. They needed to be a warrior, shepherd, and hunter. It's just they had to manage the kine, as well as the sheep and the horses. As I said before, their history was closely tied to that of the Mongolians, and they were indeed responsible for their impressive empire. Well, it was not really an empire, just a largest collection of mostly empty land and tributary states, but their military prowess is unquestionably what made them impressive. This did, however, paint a giant target on their back especially in China and the other parts of Asia. This did result in the kindred of those lands and the ones that live in Europe retaliating at them all at once. And I don't care who you are, you are not surviving that unscathed. And indeed, they did not, for they were brought low and borderline destroyed, their culture broken and eradicated. There is a reason the Empire did not last long. Some of this bloodline did survive, however, with many believing that the vast majority of Gangrel that live in Asia are Ander, but most of which just went to other nomadic peoples, as they did before the Mongolians. But they're far too split amongst each other to actually unify ever again, and their biggest enemy became each other, so they faded into obscurity, with the bloodline being seen as destroyed when nomadic nations were. Despite this, a few of them are still around, typically hiding in Asia, or just laying low for now. They did not have any form of unique power or discipline, instead fighting like most Gangrel do, but they learned much faster for unknown reasons, although it might just be due to their impressive training rather than any gifts of their blood. But it's time I move on to the next bloodline I shall discuss tonight, 
the Lianan, a group of Celtic gods and Druidic specifically, that were in many ways actually tied to the land. A strange bloodline that, if they themselves are to be believed, are not a bloodline at all, but a whole new clan of kindred unto themselves with a unique origin. Supposedly, a figure they only know as the crone infused a woodland spirit with blood, or something to that effect, I don't know the full story, to make them. Most, including myself, believe them to just be an offshoot of the Gangrel. Regardless of their origin, they are quite a strange group that I find most intriguing. I'd actually like to start with their weaknesses, for they have a few of them, and they have been most defining to their nature. For a start, they are actually bound to a woodland that they feel some form of connection to. I have no idea how they go about picking this woodland, or if it's assigned to them, or if they could change it willingly or not. But they should never leave these lands, for if they do, they will gradually become weaker over time, with the more weeks that go by sapping at their strength. But if they return, they will find all of this restored in only a short matter of hours. This means that when people started leaving the woodlands and moving into the cities, something that was becoming more and more common, they started to lose their prey. And their second weakness actually gives some credence to their unique origin story. See, when they embrace a new kindred, the new kindred is only slightly weaker than themselves, not even enough to be classed as a generation lower sometimes. But the sire is also weakened to the exact same state. In other words, when a Lianan embraces a child, it makes them weaker. According to them, this is because the spirit within them is split in two, and now those pieces must be shared. Let's get into their history, for like the others, they were tied to their original culture, the Celts. When the Romans pushed them all the way to the British Isles, there was a horrid blow to them. Then, after they left, my people started to take their lands and took what little they had left, weakening them to merely a footnote. They only really managed to hold on to true power in places like Ireland, Scotland, what is now Wales, the Celtic nations, essentially. Of course, there were still one or two holdouts of them in the mainland, but they had to have been particularly powerful to as last as long as they did. The rise of Christianity as the default among the common peoples forced all of them to leave the woods, weakening them to an insane degree after that. But the final nail in their coffin was not actually by us. It was the first Inquisition that ended them, believing them to be some other form of beast entirely. None of them survived until the Convention of Forms, and I, for one, think that that is most likely true. The idea that any of them survived is so absurd given their unique circumstances that it's borderline lunacy to suggest. But I still wish some of them were around. It's actually the main reason I'm out here tonight, but more on that later. Let us now discuss their unique powers. They have a unique manifestation of blood sorcery known as Arkham. And while not as flexible nor as powerful as, say, other blood mages, it can give them all sorts of unique aspects. And of course, all of them got more powerful within their home territory. This allowed them to talk to and even command and possibly even move plants as if they were whips, write runes that empowered themselves or cursed others, and supposedly they were able to summon, communicate, and command other woodland spirits. That's enough on the Lianan for now, anyway. Let me quickly go over one last one, one that's a little bit less known about, a bloodline tied to the Sami people of North Scandinavia, the Noayat. Their origins were so lost and muddled that even they didn't know them by the time they came into conflict with other kindred. The only reason we think they were Gangrel is because of their beast-like traits, although they did lack the discipline of fortitude. Instead, they had all specs, and they had this bizarre quirk of not being able to feed on wild animals. Other than that, they tended to stick to their local tribe. In fact, many of them only knew their own tribes, 
as when a Noayad found a Sami tribe that did not have a kindred among them, they would embrace one and leave, typically before teaching them anything, as gangrels are often wont to do. Because of this, they did not only live openly and closely to their families, but fed exclusively on them as well. But they also kept them safe from invaders and other supernatural beings, in a sort of symbiotic, perhaps more parasitic relationship. And many of them rarely, if ever, travelled away from their clans. At least not for long, anyway. They didn't even see other kindred often, since they were, by most regards, in some of the most remote places on the planet that people actually lived in back then. With the exception of the phenomenon known as the Northern Lights, although they had a different name for them. See, they believed that this was one of their gods, giving them guidance of some sort, and they had to understand what these strange skylights were trying to tell them, and interpret the will of this god. This was probably the only time other Noyads would interact with each other, as they were all drawn to these lights. They too, however, are a bloodline that has ended, since they were the biggest traditionalists you could imagine. They refused to change with the times in any minor form at all, let alone major ones. But because of the Norse peoples pushing them more north, this resulted in them being cut off from other populations, unable to regain a herd, and so they had to flee, resulting in them overfeeding on what small herds were left and killing them, ending their prey and, by extension, ending the bloodline, from what I can tell. You may have noticed that all of these bloodlines are dead or on the verge of being so since the Dark Ages, and there's a good reason for this. Times have changed. Despite man being little more than a beast, we flee this nature of ours to seek the warm comforts of cities. This happened so long ago that mortals, and even many kindred, have become afraid of the wild. The woods, who once home to us, have become a foreign nightmare. Remember this, you must always adapt to the world around you. For even Cain himself could not change the fact that we live in an environment that we have grown suited to. No matter how much we might hate it, we must adapt. We need the mortals, despite our power over them. And that is why I am out here, since I have been struggling to adapt as of late. See, all of these bloodlines were around when I was embraced. At the time, I loved to study all of our forms, but with age, I started to look down on them. Then I learned that they had gone, or most of them had at least, and I grew to miss them. Or rather, their uniqueness as an asset. Its complete removal is a loss to us all. But I have heard rumours of late, of one that survived, a Leannon that has been hidden from all of us for so long in this very wood. And I know this to be a lie, or more likely a trap laid by some werewolf or fae whose life I have ruined and completely forgotten about. But my curiosity has gotten the better of me, and so here I am investigating. Perhaps it is real and this will be like glancing at a time I've lost. Or it is fake, and helps me let go of things I should have long ago. Actually, the more I think about it, the more danger this has put you in. Perhaps you should be on. I can certainly look after myself, but you will just slow me down, no offense. Do have a safe journey, though, and remember, that there are more things we have forgotten about the wilds than we will ever know again. Thank you for listening to my tales. I'm the Ashborn. Feel free to leave a like, comment, or subscribe. It would really mean a lot to me. But, till next we meet, fellow traveller, have a good day.